Welcome to the AZ 500 exam prep session. All right, so for a storage account, we can create a stored access policy on your uh, storage account containers. Now there can be up to five stored access policies per container. When you take one of your uh, storage account keys, whether the primary or the second, and sign a shared access signature. The recipient of the SAS can present it when making REST calls against the storage API. By using a stored policy, whenever we want to shorten the uh, validity period or if we need to uh, change the access rights because our shared access signature does not include the permission within the SAS, we can simply modify the policy. Okay. An ad hoc SAS is one which the um, signature contains the permission, the timestamp, uh, when the signature starts to become valid and when it becomes expired. Those things are built into the shared access signature. Now, the only way, if you had to change your mind after you have signed a uh, shared, access signature, shared access signature, is rotate the storage account key, which you use to sign the SAS. All right. So remember, st stored access policy is what we use to reserve the rights to re revoke such a uh, permission grant. Kerberos authentication uh, is used for Windows uh, domain authentication. Azure uh, offers Azure Active Directory domain services as a hosted domain controller. Now to deploy AADDS, you must have a dedicated subnet, okay? And two IP addresses will be located in those subnets. So they help you, uh, they help your server, actually, in that VNet to join the domain. So they will be your DNS server, okay? Once you join the domain, you can use all the Kerberos and LDAP services. Now, naturally, uh, you may sync your on-prem AD using AD Connect with your Azure AD. So your AADDS will have the same set of credentials. So assuming that uh, a person may uh, try to log on to this domain joint VM, right? Because your on-prem AD is synced with AADDS, and the, a person can use the same credential for both on-prem to log on to the Azure VM. Now, typically we set up VPN, side-to-side -side VPN, uh, as, a, as a mean to have a private connections between on-prem network and your Azure network. Having a VPN does not right away allow your server to authenticate themselves or with each other. Okay. So you must either stretch your on-prem domain over or stand up another child domain up in Azure to provide Kerberos services. On-premise data gateways purpose uh, it's not for Kerberos authentication. What on-premise data gateway helps us achieve is so that when we have an on-prem network, now we may have a, say, SQL Server. Now there are data in those SQL Server we'd like to access. On-prem data gateway is an agent that has TCP connections to that SQL Server. It latches uh, onto an Azure Relay. So then the services such as Logic App, Power BI, okay, all those services, those, so those, all those platform of services that runs in the Azure Cloud can go through the Azure Relay and access data that's not otherwise accessible from the internet. 
if you're using Logic App, you can uh, use a SQL connector through a on-premise data gateway. All right, another service that can potentially take advantage of AADDS is the HD Insight cluster. Now, HD Insight is a Microsoft fully managed Hadoop cluster. Okay. Now, if we had done uh, deployed an AADDS, the HD Insight can join the domain and authenticate users using the same on-prem credential. All right, so keep in mind, in order to support Kerberos, we're going to have to deploy AADDS, Azure Active Directory Domain Services. All right. When you set up a AD Connect, uh, there are various ways for users to perform uh, the sign in. This diagram depicts pass through authentication. When a user is trying to access an application that's protected by Azure AD, okay. the website goes, well, I don't really know who you are. Would you mind signing in for me? And because the app depends on Azure AD, the app forwards with a redirect to Azure AD. Now, with a path-through authentication, with a path-through authentication, your user will supply the username and password. Azure AD encrypted, placed on a queue. And here's that path-through agent that constantly monitors the queue. And then it passes through. This is your on-prem domain controller. This is your on-prem uh, Active Directory setup. So keep in mind with a path through authentication, your domain controller is doing the verification. Therefore, uh, if you have any sort of security policies, it will apply. Okay. Uh, everything that you, you, you set up as a, as a domain policy, it will still be enforced by the domain controller. Now, the Active Directory is going to do the verification and return the results back to the client. The agent then sends back to Azure AD. And Azure AD completes the signing process by issuing a standard JWT token representing the user. And the JWT is presented to the website for logging on, for access authorization. Now, the pros with pass-through authentication is that it's really simple to set up. Okay, and there's a single source of uh, a truth in your domain controller. Uh, passwords are not, or password hashes, are not further synchronized to Azure AD. And it's fairly straightforward in terms of uh, deployment. Okay, you just need an agent somewhere that has communica uh, channels, communication channels to the domain controller, and you're good to go. Now this, uh, um, uh, well, on the other hand, if you have something like ADFS, that ADFS can be used to support other federated sign-on. So you might already have a web app in your company that relies on your own ADFS because you have partner organizations that need to sign in. Okay, so if that's the case, password authentication can help you much here. Okay, it won't be able to support your web app that needs to sign in your partner employees. All right. And frankly, to make sure the ADFS deployment is secure, uh, it's, uh, it's quite a bit of overhead. All right. But in either case, path through authentication or ADFS, it is always the domain controller that does the verification. Okay. All right. So the end result is that your employee can be at home, fire up a uh, home computer, visit web app and continue to use your company credential to sign in single sign on when you create ad connect it will set up a default replication you get a chance to select what ou's uh, to include in the replication occasionally you may you may decide to uh, 
uh, wanting to change that synchronization rules. Okay, or you may want to reconfigure different OUs. So when you click on the Start menu, okay, you will find a tool called Synchronization Rule Editor, and you'll see all the uh, rules that Synchronization Engine runs through. And you can filter by organizational unit, object attributes, then the type of objects. Right. Now this this is specific to AD Connect Express installation. When the AD Connect startup and you click on Express installation, you go through the UI elements. Okay. Uh, you'll be prompted for global admin. And you'll also be prompted for an enterprise admin. Okay. It's not the least privileged approach, okay, but for an express settings, uh, you just provide these two credentials and you're good to go. All right. So the express settings, uh, by the way, when you're going through the slides, if you come across these colored things these are some supporting documents that you can uh, follow and and sometimes there are additional reads up read ups okay. all right so what we added uh, when you are going through the ad connect now most of the times uh, we will associate our tenant with a vanity domain in this case, fabricononline.com. Now you're gonna have to make sure it's a verified domain and we can then synchronize users to that UPN suffix. Our goal is try to keep your user uh, using the same ID both on-prem and in Azure. So the person doesn't have to remem remember one username for your cloud stuff and one for your own prep so sort of defeat the purpose of us synchronizing directories all right with the azure active directory premium p2 okay we will have a feature called identity protection now azure continuously access risk involving uh, our, our uh, employees' credential leaking through uh, various data dumps okay. or risk involved in possible travel, unfamiliar locations, uh, anonymous IP location, etc. Okay. So each one of these activities are ranked with a different risk factor. Now, for the sake of preparation, we're going to remember the two easy to remember one. Okay. If you somehow leaked your credential, we can see your username and we can see your password or password hash in paste bins. Uh, I do that sometimes for, for a classroom purpose, right? I'll, I'll put a username and password on paste bins so a student can go ahead and sign in. Uh, that's high risk stuff. All right. IP with suspicious activities, uh, that's actually ranked as a low risk assessment. All right, and anything else in between is medium. So for now, just remember, IP with suspicious activity is low. Because, you know, suspicious. Innocent until proven guilty, eh? All right, and leaked credential. Uh, we know you leaked it, so that is a high risk. All right, so just remember the high risk and the low risk, and the rest is all medium in the middle of things. Access review is a feature of PIM. All right. Access review is a feature of PIM. Let's put this out. And I'm sure you know what PIM stands for, Privileged Identity Management. Okay. Now with that feature activated, we can create access review, which solicit either a reviewer Okay, uh, or members of a special privilege role. We need 
confirmation that these membership are still warranted. At the end of the access review, we will know who to keep into the in this uh, privilege role and who to remove. Okay, so it's one of the features of PIN. Okay, so the steps of creating an access review, well, you need to create an access review program, create a access review control, set a reviewer to a group owner, so let the group owner decide who still belongs to those groups. Access review program, access review control, select review. All right. Now, part of deploy PIN, uh, you need to consent to PIN, MFA verify identity, and sign up for PIN. It's pretty straightforward. All right, so now let's say we have a challenge. Let's say our organization has lots of branches. All right. And our CSO needs the ability to read configurations and logs in all of the subscriptions. So I'm going to use blue to represent subscriptions. Now, to try to reinforce this cons uh, consistent row assignment, uh, if we do one subscription at a time, it becomes very tedious. We can go to like, subscription one, put the CSO in the reader role. Okay. Now, alternatively, uh, an alternative approach is by deploying something called management group. A management group is a tree-like structure typically reflect your organizational uh, hierarchy. Sometimes they're designed uh, based on geolocations. Sometimes they're based on business functions. Okay. These management groups are tree-like structures where the leaf, the leaf object in this tree are subscriptions. Just like a folder structure. The leaf object of a photo structure is a subscription. So the leaf object of a management groups are subscriptions as well. Now once we have organized these subscriptions, there's a facility we can use called Azure Blueprint. All right. Azure Br Blueprint is one of those objects that can be deployed at subscription level and even better, management group level. Okay. A blueprint contains resources, role assignment, policies, and resource group all rolled into one. So when you deploy this blueprint to a management, management group, you will then be able to consistently apply these role assignments. All right, so here's an example of my management group in my tenant. Okay, so I have three subscriptions. I believe one of them is expired. So in order for you to see this management group, to even see it, you must be a global admin with elevated privilege. So I am a global admin in my directory tenant. But in order for me to manage the tenant root, I must go to Azure Active Directory and give myself an elevated access. So that's under properties. Okay, so notice I've already turned on access management. Now in the, the important thing I want to remind you is that directory tenant global admin manages directories. This directory can be the source of identity for any number of subscriptions. You can have lots and lots of subscriptions, depends on the same tenant. Global admin can manage the directory, 
but by default they can't by default they cannot just go to these subscriptions and start willy-nilly create stuff modify things yes they can add themselves to a variety of roles to make that happen okay uh, but by default these global admins okay must elevate to uh, elevate their access management in order to see all the Azure subscriptions and management group in this tenant. So that is in Azure AD, Properties, Access Management. All right, so once you've done this, you can then head over to Management Group. Now, this is a tree-like structure. You are, let's say I want to organize my organization uh, based on geography. All right, so I'll create that. And what happened is once I lay out the hierarchy, I will then move these subscription objects into their appropriate uh, branch. Okay, so it takes a little time to get that. And I can navigate into it and then create another child. So I have East, US, I may have uh, Boston, New York City, etc. Okay, so this forms an upside down tree, basically. Okay, just like that. Now, each one of these management group, for example, this is the tenant root, right? We can apply policies, we can apply role assignment. And notice I'm a tenant root. So what that means is if I make a role assignment here, it will flow down to every subscription below the tenant root. All right. Now, if you go to policies, you can define some corporate policy that applies to all the subscription at once. Blueprint, if you have one. Okay. So here, I'm going to start with one of the out-of-the-box blueprints. All right. Now, this blueprint can be stored. In this example, I'm going to store them right at tenant root. Blueprint contains artifacts. Okay, so the different kind of artifacts includes a bunch of policy or initiative assignment, like that. All right, so I can say uh, I want some built-in policy or initiative. All right, so I'll add this. And notice this setting applies to the subscription. I can then add other artifacts. So for example, I can add a resource group. So this makes sure whoever received this blueprint will always have the same resource group. So I want to make sure all my subscription has an audit RG. Okay. Audit RG. So there will be consistencies across all my subscriptions. And locations, where should this be? All right. We're going to say it's going to all be East US. Now, with this resource group, I can add more artifact within that resource group instead of to the subscription. So here I can add another artifact that uh, is another set of policy only affect that resource group. I can also add row assignment. So my CSO will always be reader of a specific group. All right, like that. All right. And of course, I can deploy a whole bunch of resources using an ARM template. So the drop down box here should contain an ARM template. I can supply the ARM template as well as the parameters here. And these resources will be created consistently. All right, so once you save it, you have a blueprint draft. All right. All right. So when you're ready, select Publish Blueprint version one. Here's that. So create one, publish one, and deploy it. All right. There you go. So 
the last the next step is to assign this blueprint part of assigning the blueprint And notice blueprints are assigned to subscriptions, unlike ARM templates. ARM templates are, subs, uh, are uh, assigned within the resource group. Blueprint can be assigned to multiple subscriptions at once. All right. These are parameters to those policies that you'll fill in. And once you assign, it gets created. And there's that. All right, so only Azure Blueprint can be deployed against subscriptions. All right. So once you organize your subscriptions, use Blueprints to uh, deploy them in mess to have some consistencies across subscriptions. All right, so Azure Container Registry is where we keep our container images. All right. To upload, image you need to have a contributor or acr push all right so acr push is this our back role it allows you to both push and pull the image all right so if you want the ability to download an image which is known as pushing uh, sorry pull pulling an image so those owners contributors reader arc push and arc pull they can all download images. All right, so there's that. Okay. Now keep in mind that reader has more permissions because reader will be able to read all the attribute of your Azure Container Registry, while the ACR pool is limited in reading your repository image so, so make sure you know the difference here all right so if you have an app service which you use to host website and you want to add a custom domain with an SSL support okay uh, you got to upload a matching SSL triple does encrypted uh, private exported keys and add the host name which will be www.abc.com so that matches your SSO certificate name. All right, so when it comes to PIM, Privilege Identity Management, there are two ways of giving someone a role assignment, whether it's RBAC role or AD role. Active assignment, as soon as you log in, you will receive the permission within the role. Eligible assignment requires you to activate those privileges before you can use them. All right, if a role requires MFA, a user with disabled MF settings will not be able to activate them. Okay, you can go to aka.ms slash proof up. To uh, proof up, to provide the MFA material before you try to activate uh, your roles. Now, a user can self-approve the request, right? If that PIM role uh, contains the same user as the activation approver. All right, so don't have to wait for another person to approve it. Azure Active Directory Integrate Authentication, uh, if you have a, a workstation that's AADDS uh, domain join and you use to access uh, a service like a SQL Server that has Azure Active Directory Integrated Authentication, uh, your OS token handling will just pass on the token. So just like Windows integrated, there won't be additional uh, prompt for username and password. Now, Key Vault can be used to supply secrets uh, to an ARM template. So in the parameter file, you need a reference to Key Vault's resource ID. So there's that. And usually the parameter looks like
All right. So to reference a key vault secret in your ARM template, so notice admin login is a string, so you can type that in. But admin password is a secure string. When a type is declared as secure string in your parameter section, you can prepare a parameter file. Now in that parameter file, you'll find that the admin password is not actually collected during deployment. Rather, the admin password is a reference to a key vault location. And as long as the key vault is set up for template deployment, these secrets can be pulled during deployment time. And the purpose of this is so the person who deploys the service doesn't need to know the password. If you have a subscription you'd like to transfer to another user, keep in mind uh, the person who we are transferring to has to be an account that's native to a AAD tenant. Okay, It cannot be uh, one of those Microsoft accounts or federated OpenID Connect accounts. All right, so it's uh, well documented here. When we deploy an Azure Kubernetes services, the advanced networking option let us deploy our container, our pods, to receive a VNet IP. Okay, so they essentially become little virtual machines within your VNet. Okay, now that feature is called network interface or container network interface. Oops. Okay. By keeping these pods as present on your VNet subnets, that means when these pod tries to go out and access, for example, Azure File Shares or Azure SQL Server, okay, they will be using whatever you have deployed into that subnet. Okay. Uh, they wouldn't go out to the internet to find those things. So they could use service endpoint if you have deployed one. In your VNet subnet. All right, so it's called Container Network Interface Plugin. A desired state configuration is a feature of PowerShell. Uh, we can use this to configure machine with, uh, uh, for example, web server roles and all these other add remove roles things you can do. All right, we declare here's our intention. This is our desired state of our works uh, of our server, and PowerShell makes sure it happens. Okay, we can use this to configure Windows features. We can use it to uh, set up domains, forests, we can manage what service should start and should not start, and various other settings. All right, so we deploy this DSC along with our ARM template. So once the machine comes up, it pulls the these uh, DSC files and set itself up. Okay. All right. If you have deployed an Azure firewall, so in this diagram you can see the Azure firewall is in an isolated subnet. Okay. To route these traffic, keep in mind that uh, if you are routing inbound traffic or incoming traffic, these traffic will appear to originate from the gateway subnet because in order for any traffic outside of VNet to enter, okay, there are really two choices, one through a load balancer, which is Azure Network Magic, or a gateway subnet. Okay, if you have a gateway subnet, people can dial into the gateway subnet and from there access resources. Now, what we want to do is deploy a user-defined route to the gateway subnet, so all traffic flows through the firewall. Now we have a central place to allow or deny access. 
Now, if we want our spoke, if you have a hub and spoke design and you want your spoke network to be able to bounce everything through the firewall, you also need to deploy a user defined route to the spoke VNet. All right, so that way it allows your spoke VNet and your on prem network to communicate through the firewall and be held. Uh, uh, up to those rules you define in the Azure Firewall. All right. Using Azure policies to deploy anti-malware extension. Okay. Now there is a complete policy on GitHub that you can follow and download and use it if you if you like. All right. Now in this policy, uh, things of interests is our obviously our policy rules, right? So here, if we're deploying against virtual machine, and here's a list of image, blah, blah, image, publisher, all right, so on and so forth. So if all these, if the condition meets, all right, the effect of this template is to deploy something, if that something doesn't exist. So, when you're deploying a virtual machine, and if you did not include this extension, and this extension is known as IaaS anti-malware. Okay. If they don't exist in your ARM template, we are going to deploy it if it doesn't exist. All right. And these are uh, the template of that deployment. All right. All right. Deployment and that's the keyword to remember. Uh, effect deploy if not exist. One other thing to remember is that if the effect is deployed if not exist, who is doing the deployment, right? So if you choose that effect, your policy, your policy must be associated with a managed service identity. So these things can be deployed. If the effect is audit only, then you simply you know record something as violating the policies. But if your effect is deploy if not exist, then you must supply a managed service identity. All right, AKS uh, to ACR. Just remember, you need to have a service principle, and that service principle should have some RBAC roles, right? Contributors, ACR pool, whatever. Now, this is the old traditional way to do it. Today, you can update an existing AKS by attaching it to the ACR. It will save you all that creating you know, service identity business. Now, if you like to create a brand new AKS cluster, you also have that choice. Okay, AKS create cluster and make sure it is attaching to the ACR by name. All right. So those are two newer way of doing things. In the past, we used to create a service principle and then we assign our bad roles to the service principle. Today, all you need to do is attaching. All right. Now you can place a read-only resource lock on the resource group. When you do that, it prevents any additional change to the resource group. You will not be able to deploy any more resources you cannot delete any resources in that resource group and certainly cannot write to the resource. Activities such as start and stop VM actually presents a write to the object's property. If you cannot write to that project uh, object's property, then that action will fail. So if you place a read-only resource lock, you won't be able to start or stop VMs. All right, VM update management takes advantage of the automation account. So it's one of those uh, uh, automation account features. A few things you should be aware of if you want to deploy update management. Uh, it's, it's really just a, more or less a log analytic agent, so a Microsoft monitoring agent. All right, so these VMs must be running. So you can see from the screenshot, if you have a machine that isn't running, you can't deploy them. 
your update management is going to connect to a log analytic workspace. If a VM is connected to a different workspace, then you also cannot manage the updates. It has to connect to the same workspace that your update management is using. All right, and these update management will work both for Linux or Windows, and they all work just fine. Linux will go to their own uh, repositories, and Windows has Windows Update. All right, Resource Manager is how Azure organize all the services in Azure. This is known as a resource provider, Microsoft.Compute. Okay. Uh, you can follow this link to see that Microsoft.Compute resource provider provides both virtual machine and virtual machine scale set. All right, so let's take you to those objects documentation. Now here is a reference that shows you the permissions or the actions and their corresponding description. All right. All right, so resource provider, resources, and what you're trying to do against those objects. All right, an RBAC role is simply a collection of actions you are allowed to perform, right? So we create a role-based access control. A role encompasses these capabilities. All right, write a gallery image. read an image, so on and so forth. So if your role contains Microsoft.Compute slash star, you simply can perform everything you see within a compute. Okay, so that's a whole lot of things. All right. So that means you can do all of these things you see because, you know, star. All right, you can create a new virtual machine, you can modify the settings, you can do anything you want with the virtual machine. Now, there's one thing that sounds that I need to bring attention. Okay, the act of attaching a NIC is not part of Microsoft.Compute. It's actually part of Microsoft.Network. So if you think about it, uh, the fact that you're attaching a NIC means you're placing a computing resource on one of the VNets. Uh, the act of placing a computer resource onto a network requires your Microsoft.network permission. And I looked it up, Microsoft.network slash network interfaces slash join slash action. So this tells you that it's the Microsoft.network provider. All right, to be able to attach NIC card. So remember, Microsoft.Compute isn't enough to do just that, attaching NIC. All right, VM, uh, again, the VM update management. The updates are obviously OS specific. Try to take a Windows update and apply on Linux. Uh, duh. Now, Linux update can be applied to the distros, and they have their own repository to download updates from. All right, NSG and ASG. Now, there's one rule that I want to clarify up front. Azure VNets are regional. NSG, ASG, VNet, Low Balancer, Application Gateway. If you want any of them to work together, they all have to be in the same region. None of these can cross region. All right, so that's things to keep in mind. When you're taking the AZ500, if you ever see the word region shows up in a question anywhere, Pay attention because things that's not in the same region network wise uh, probably won't work. All right. All right. So here in this subnet, we have four machines. All right. These two machines belong to application security group two 
and application security group one. Let's suppose that's two, that's one. And we have application security group three and four representing four machines. All right, so let's see. We want to allow VM4 to talk to VM3. All right, so we need an ASG to ASG. Allow VM1 and 2 to the internet. Okay. All right. So how many uh, NSG and rules do we need? Okay. Allow VM4 to VM3, that would be one rule. Allowing these to the internet, you know what, I, I'm just starting to debate, maybe we don't need to worry about that because that's actually a built-in rule. Stand corrected. All right, so you just need this guy. Now you want to prevent uh, three and four to the internet. So you really just need two rules. And of course I screenshotted this, so I can't really change that. Huh? Oh, I'm, I'm, I, I got my ways. I'm just going to like black it out. Yeah, that works. All right, just got to work with me here. Now you can have a single NSG bound to uh, two. Uh, to, sorry, to four NIC. And two NSGs. Because uh, the requirement to block something, uh, sorry, to, the requirement to allow something to go to the internet, uh, that is built into every NSG. It's a, built-in policy. So there's that. So make it two. Make it two. Yeah. Catch my drift? Yeah. Two rules. Of course I screen cap this. All right, so event, uh, sorry, flow logging for NSG. Your NSG is going to allow deny traffic all day long. And if we can capture all these NSG flow, then we can derive intelligence out of them. All right. So it is possible for you to turn on NSG flow log so you can say who is talking to what. All right. So this is the NSG flow logs. So it captures the IP flow handle through the network security group. All right, so it's going to capture all this information. When you have some time, take a look. It's, it's all the source destination. Okay, so this is a one sample record. All right. Now, what we're interested in is how to enable this flow log. So there are a few steps you should be aware of. Naturally, you need a virtual machine. You need to enable Network Watcher in that region. Okay, so if you deploy the VM in East US, then your Network Watcher should be East US. All right. You need to register a resource provider called Microsoft.Insights, and then enable the NSG flow log To enable NSG flow log, make sure you have a storage account at ready. All right. Okay. And then turn on the flow log for the NSG you are interested. And select the account you have just prepared. All right. So to condense this information, enable Network Watcher regions. Okay, pay attention to the regions. All right. Of course, your VM, your NIC, your NSG is all going to be the same region, right? You cannot have a NIC in a different region than the VM. So make sure the Network Watcher is enabled on the region, whether it's VM or NIC, doesn't matter.
it's the same one register insights Microsoft insights resource provider resource provider and then enable the NSG logs our NSG flow log all right and once you have the information you can turn on traffic analysis and uh, get maps of you know traffic coming into your service and traffic leaving your service fun stuff all right so when you're presented with a bunch of NSG keep in mind you have to mentally put them in the right order so watch out for this okay remember the lowest priority is evaluated first if there's a allow or deny that match the rule no further evaluation will be done okay so if you have a rule that matches the request inbound or outbound once that rule has confirmed for that request or for that traffic right it will not consider any other rules all right so here we have three rules can a vm connect to storage account well rule priority 110 is the first one that's evaluated it allows outbound to storage UK South service tag. So can VN connect to storage account? Yes, if the storage account is in UK South. Notice on the second rule, which deny all outbound to storage service tag. So that means the only storage account you can connect to through these NSG rules is storage account in UK South. Anywhere else will be blocked. All right. Now the inbound source IP 7777 slash 32, we know slash 32 represent a single host, right? It's not a subnet. And the rule says destination 100010 slash 32. All right, so this rule will only apply if the source is going to specific that destination so if you're going to 10.0.0.5 of course it will fail because it's not in that rule and every NSG has a deny all rule on inbound as a default rule so it will be denied all right Now, here's something that I wanted to, to uh, stress. Okay. A key vault, first and foremost, is an Azure resource. It will live under resource group. Users will have our back access just like any other resource just like storage account just like vm just like vnet there is an r back that gives people pr uh, permissions to manage this key vault resource all right so if you were to configure a key vault access policy you must to uh, you must belong to a role that has permission to manage key vault all right so if you want someone to be able to manage key vault you have to assign them an RBAC role to the key vault contributor or owner that individual can then go to the key vault and go to access policy now access policy is enforced by the key vault itself it is telling key vault what request to serve and what request not to because key vault is made out of a bunch of rest calls these access policy simply defines who has the right to make these calls in a sense consuming the key vault service okay so make sure you're very clear this RBAC role to manage the key vault itself configure it set it up configure access policies and then there are people who consume that service that have zero access to the key vault. Okay. So they can consume encryption, decrypt, 
secret retrieval and that sort of thing from the keyboard themselves. All right. The keyboard can be used to supply a uh, key for for the purpose of VM disk encryption. All right. So you can use Key Vault key for bring your own key. The virtual machine has a managed identity. Now you got to give that managed identity these permissions. Okay. They need to be able to wrap and unwrap keys. Because the VM identity is responsible to unwrap the symmetric key to decrypt the disk. Now, Key Vault must be in the same region as the VM. For natural reasons, you really don't want to consume a service from far away. Okay, that just adds to the latency of the process. And it's a hard rule that Key Vault must be in the same region as your virtual machine. All right. Now, VM uh, disk encryption does not support basic or A series VMs. Ubuntu 16.04 runs on Gen 2 VM. Uh, so it is what it is. All right, connect Azure VM to log analytics. Uh, here's the thing you need to know. A virtual machine can decide to connect to log analytics workspace in any region. Okay, at the end of the day, it's just an endpoint. Not only you can connect Azure VMs, you can connect on-premise VM, AWVMs, Google VMs, VMs in your friend's house. Yeah, there's that. All right, AKS incoming traffic routing. Azure gives you two choices out of the box when you create AKS. Do you want layer four or do you want layer seven? We can give you either one. All right. More money, less money. We cool? All right, uh, if you are an AKS purist, okay, and because your plan is one day take all your pods containers out of Azure and jump to, say, Amazon and jump to, say, Google, what you're trying to avoid is using any of these integrated stuff. Because when you rely on this, you know, Azure App Gateways, uh, it will be difficult for you to go to another cloud provider because it's so comfortable. You know, a checkbox, boom, WAF, uh, multi data center deployment. It's awesome. You get used to it, you get comfortable. And then the next thing you do, the next thing you know, is that you can no longer bring your app somewhere else. All right, so one way to maintain that control is to deploy your own ingress controller in the form of a pod and the service okay, and just map traffic to it. All right, so you can deploy your own AKS ingress controller. Usually we use an Nginx, which is just like Azure Application Gateway. My suspicion is, you know, Azure Application Gateway is really an Nginx under the cover anyways. Kind of do the same thing. So there's a link of how to do that, but understand the rationale behind why you want to do that. Okay. All right, so we talked something uh, to this effect. Okay, so if you want to deploy something to multiple subscriptions, use a management group. All right, so step one, create a management group. Step two, move subscriptions. Step three, assign policies. All right, so if you have the same policy, you want to consistently enforce them across multiple subscriptions this is the way to do it all right okay all right so this is another anti-malware extension uh, type of drill all right keep in mind if you deploy the policy to a resource group okay that will wind up deploying anti-malware to all the vm within that resource group so pretty convenient. Azure Security Center has an adaptive 
application control. All right. So the purpose of that is to identify what is the potential malware. Okay, so we can control exactly what application should run on those machines. All right. You can also use that to uh, stop some program from uh, uh, running on your infrastructures. All right, so it's very similar to the way the app locker uh, behaves. So it helps you improve your compliance with local security policy that dictate the use of only licensed softwares. Okay. So that's called adaptive application control. Keeps an eye on what you can run on those infrastructure VMs. All right, so that's slide number 36. I'll produce one video.